Okay, so um, welcome everybody uh, to this event. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very happy. Uh, I think this is our 14th uh, next gen uh, event that uh, Paula has been helping us organize and, and we're very happy uh, to have another one of these. My name is Victor Aleñar. Uh, I, I work here at IE University. For any of you that don't know, IE University is a university in Madrid, Spain. Uh, but we have also a campus in Segovia, and we like to say that we have a huge campus online. Uh, from If you can see from the chat, we have a very global reach um, and like uh, interacting uh, with everybody globally. Also have a lot of uh, our masters are uh, online, so you can, you can see the, uh, this kind of reach through that. Um, at the IE School of Architecture and Design, we have four master programs. Um, we have two in real estate development. So we have a part-time master's in real estate and we have a full-time master's in real estate. We also have a very interesting master's in business for architecture and design that looks at the business side of architecture and design. And uh, starting next year, we're gonna have a master's in architecture uh, for anybody interested in becoming a licensed architect in Spain and in Europe. But uh, without further ado, um, I'll, I'll give the floor to Paula Gonzalez, who uh, helps us organize these uh, lectures and also does a bit of host, but also interviewee. Um, so thank you so much, pa Paula, for joining us today. And uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Victor. I'm only here to introduce Steve. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. This is our next gen uh, events. As you know, thank you for being part of this amazing initiative, which has helped us bring people to the stage such as Steve today. I think it's our 14th session now and uh, it's only going to keep growing and being better uh, every time. So I just wanted to say how I met Steve and what I was so shocked about. Uh, when I was based in London, I went to these a uh, very posh event for real estate people called London Real Estate Forum, which takes place at Berkeley Square and it's full of people in blue suits. And so I'm there and then I see this man dressed as a pink cowboy in the middle of the sea of blue suits. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Who's this person? And then I started talking to you, Steve. And then it all become, became like this, you know, amazement and this, this, this wow factor about what you do and how your business rolls and so on. So uh, I'm very happy to introduce Steve Edge Design. Uh, it's a London-based global brand and digital agency. And you guys specialize in brand design, identity, strategy, um, digital design build. You'll tell us more about it, but the floor is Yours, Steve, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm not wearing my pink cowboy outfit today, but uh, it's so lovely to, to be with you all, um, all of us coming together as we do in this time of, I'm not gonna harp on about the sadness which is going on over in Ukraine, but it's great that we can all be together um, here tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Danny, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be able to tell my story because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long old story and the fact that I've been in this business for a very long time and, and I was very fortunate, uh, I, I was very fortunate that, that when I was four years old, uh, I found my passion. I found my passion because I discovered uh, glitter, magic markers and plastic scissors and uh, and from that, that's all I wanted to do. But also in conjunction with that, I was very fortunate that uh, here living in the East End, that coming from a poor family, but not in love or life, but, uh, uh, but just with no money, uh, that, that, that they sent me to a school and the school sent me back within, well, well, within one week and said, we can't teach this child. This child is, can't come and stay with us. He's too disruptive. Uh, and I was sent home, which was quite weird. But luckily for me, my father had a, had a very good friend and, and he was called Dennis Gray. And he was head of a huge publication called IPC Magazines. And he had married a woman from New Zealand and she was ironically unbeknown to us, a dyslexic and a special needs teacher. So she saw me as a four year old and said, this kid, 
he's not the village idiot, but he has all these different conditions and, and I would like to teach him. So my father being a very bohemian, although he, was, uh, he worked in the meat market here in Smithfield Meat Market, he was an artist and my mother was a painter, but they uh, allowed me not to obviously try and find further education at four years old because it was impossible. Uh, and, I, and, and I was allowed to go and be home taught, which was my saving, my big saving. I mean, I've never left Shoreditch. I've, I've lived in Shoreditch all my life as a child. Um, in fact, the building we're in now is very interesting. My studio uh, 40 years ago, I fancied living and working and having an opportunity in Shoreditch where I could live and work. And, uh, and, and in those days, uh, it was empty. You know, you only went to Shoreditch to get killed. Nobody ever went to Shoreditch. You did, truly. It was so dodgy, it wasn't true. And, uh, but growing up in this area, Bethnal Green was next door to Shoreditch. But Shoreditch was full of all these amazing Victorian warehouses beautiful Victorian warehouses, where obviously a lot of the Jewish population, where my mother obviously being my mother's Jewish, uh, was where it was furniture makers. There was a lot of furniture making and obviously fashion, clothes and, uh, 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 and weaving. Um, uh, and, and of course I said to a friend of mine, I wanna buy one of these warehouses, you know, where, where can I get one from? And uh, my friend said, well, there's a guy called James Goff. It's now called Sterling Ackroyd, which is a real big estate agent. But 40 years ago, it was one man. And he said, he said, to go and see this guy, James, he'll find you one of the buildings that you want in Shoreditch. So we walked around Shoreditch and, and found the one I wanted, this amazing building in a street called Raby Street. And we found James Goff and James said, yeah. I went in and he said, yeah, what do you want? I said, I, I, I want one of these Victorian warehouses excuse me, and he said, uh, what one do you want? <laughs> and I said, excuse me, that's a big ask. I said, you're the estate agent, you're supposed to tell me what one I can add. You're now telling me I can choose whatever I want. He went, yeah, what one? I went, okay, come with me. So I took him around the corner, I pointed to this building and I said, I want that building. Now, he doesn't say he's yours, because that's what I assume. He says, leave it with me. And I went, hang on a second. That ain't, that ain't my building. You told me I could have it. And now you're telling me leaving it with you. He said, yeah, leave it with me. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, oh, you're not going to shut up, are you? I said, no, I'm not. He said, okay, well, I'm going to tell you my secret. He said, but don't tell anybody. And of course, I love that. When somebody says, don't tell anybody, you're thinking, who can I tell? <laughs> who can I tell? Anyway, so, uh, so he says, look, he said, this building, I have no idea who owns it. And I've probably got no idea to try and track down who owns it. He said, but I've got my system. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a for sale sign on that building that I don't own. And trust me, within two days, the Jewish family that owns this building will be ringing me and going, what the fuck are you doing putting a for sale sign on my building? And they'll go, do you want to sell it? And they'll go, yeah. And lo and behold, he rings me up the next day, he said, the family's been on the phone. They told me off. I said, do you want to sell it? And they said, yeah. And that's how we got our building. And I think that's genius. You know, the fact is, from now on, guys, if you see a beautiful house you love, don't go to an estate agent. Just put your name and number on the outside of the building and uh, someone will ring you and, uh, and then you can probably buy it from them, you know, for sale. Put a for sale sign on the building. So, so we're very fortunate that we've lived in this area and we've seen the, the incredible changes that's gone on in such a kind of, like I say, from being killed to being the hipster fill of the world here in Shoreditch. But... Uh, you know, going back to myself and then being very fortunate with this glitter, magic markers and plastic scissors, the fact was that I was allowed to be free in this house. So, of course, Dennis Gray, who was the guy who was married to Valerie, who was the dyslexic expert, he was the one that had three publications that he looked after with this big group. One was Practical Woodworker, one was Practical Home Builder, and one was practical boat builder. So very interestingly, in this incredible household, I was allowed to do my studies in the morning and then in the afternoon go and help Dennis. Now in those days, remember, can you imagine 60 years ago, there's no Apple Maps, 
There's no CGI's. Everything was created by hand. So he had a workshop and a studio in his home. And if we was gonna do a story on how to build a small mirror dinghy with the sail and the rudder and everything, we would have to make it, varnish it, paint it, create the sail, sewing machine, and then build it and then photograph it in stages to create the article. Every day I did my studies in the morning and I'd go and help Dennis. At five years old, funny enough, my mother then bought me my own sewing machine so I could start making my own clothes. Now, I don't know whether you ever tried to put zip in a pair of trousers, it's difficult. Dresses are really easy. So I found that I could make long flowing dresses, fabrics given to me by all the neighbors, beautiful flowers, those early 60s flower power patterns. And I would make my long dresses to the floor, skinny little blonde kid, barefoot, and I made all my own clothes. So I lived like this for quite a few years as a child until I was 12 years old, making, working, and doing my studies. At 12 years old, I was given my own double page spread in a very famous magazine that Dennis had called Look and Learn. And every month I'd have to come up with a concept and create the article. One month it would be Easter. That's an easy one. I had to decorate Easter eggs and make Easter cards. The following month, I knew it was getting cold and therefore tortoises would start to need to be hibernating. So I would design and create the tortoise hibernation box. I had to make that and the tortoise would be very happy in the most beautiful designer tortoise safety box in the world. Anyway, at 12, it was amazing. And then unfortunately the day came at 13 years old and knock at the door. I answered the door and there was a man called the school board man. By law, I have to go to school, by law. And, uh, and remember, I've never been to school and I can't go to school. And of course, my form of dyslexia, I've never read a book in my life still today. I can't read nothing. It's, uh, it doesn't go in, it just disappears. So examinations are impossible and, and, and obviously any form of, 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 of trying to read anything just doesn't work for me. However, I've never seen it as a problem. I always saw it as a great advantage because it's always about communication and, and actually speaking to everybody and people. Then once you tell people you're dyslexic, it's incredible. People want to help you. You know, I go to the train station and I walk in the train station and all the gobbledygook. And then I just ask somebody, excuse me, can you help me? Um, I'm dyslexic. Now they think you can't walk, right? They grab your arm, come with me. And then they take me, put me on the train, tell everybody, oh, this man's dyslexic. Uh, can you help him? He needs to get off at Dawkins. I love it. I can sit there, be free. I can look at my pictures, book, <laughs> and then with my lollipop and then being told that I'm getting off at the next station. So I've never seen it, seen it as a problem. Um, so I have to go to school. Dennis Gray writes a letter and I go to a posh school in Dulwich, far from the school here in, uh, in, uh, in, in Bethnal Green. I live in the art department and I stay in the art department for two years. And then I'm allowed to uh, do, be free, to be absolutely free. At 15, they then, the head of art said, there's this incredible competition. It's called European Artist of the Year competition. And I got invited to go to uh, uh, create a piece of work and I entered it. And luckily for me, I won it. I won European Artist of the Year at 15. And then I was given, a, a guy was there, from a very big design agency and he says Steve would you come and work with us and I said yes please so 15 I get myself a job I'm now in this amazing design agency and above all else the most luckiest thing I was given was they had the Muppet account they did the Muppet show account so they said Steve work on the Muppet show account so you know it didn't take too long I'm, I'm 15 by the time I'm 16 I know Frank Oz and Jim Henson and all the Muppet team and then they said, Steve, would you come and work with us full time on the Muppet Show? And of course, luckily for me, the owner of the design agency, he gave me my blessing and he said, yeah, you must go off and work on the Muppet Show at ATV Studios at Boreham Wood, which I did. Every week, it was incredible. We were designing all the sets. We were designing, working on puppets. We were making all the things and, um, and props. And then... And then I got the biggest shock in my life when I was coming up to my 17th birthday when Jim Henson said, Steve, there's a man over the road who wants to meet you. 
And I went, why are you getting rid of me? And he said, I never said that. I said, yes, you did. Where I come from, that's getting rid of you. So he said, uh, no, we want you to go over and see this guy. If you don't like what you see, you come back to us. We don't want to get rid of you, but there's an opportunity. I said, okay, who have I got to go and see? He said, you have to go and see a man called George Lucas. So I went, who the fuck is George Lucas? I never heard of George Lucas. And he said, oh, he's a, he's a, he's a producer. He's an amazing guy. He's made a film called American Graffiti, and he wants to meet you. So I went over the road, two posh women met me at the door, took me upstairs. Remember, I'm like just coming up to my 17th birthday hippie and uh, sit in front of him. And he says, Steve, I love all your work. I want you to come and work with me. I said, OK. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to work in the art department. I said, what do you want me to do in the art department? He went, anything you want. Now, remember, as long as I've got glitter, magic, markers, plastic scissors, I am happy. So I said, can I see the art department? He went, yeah. So he took me to this amazing art department, carpentry shops, ironmongery, bending metal, welding, spray booth departments, plastic vacuum form machine. I can't believe it. I come back, I sit with him. I went, whoa, that's the best art department I've ever seen. He said, you like it? I said, I love it. I said, what's the film going to be about? He said, it's going to be the greatest science fiction film ever. I said, wow, what's it going to be called? He said, it's going to be called Star Wars. And I went, that is a blinding name. I said, I love that name. He said, you like it? I went, yeah. So lo and behold, I was very fortunate. I worked on Star Wars. We worked on the Millennium Falcon. We did the bar scene. We did all those wonderful things. And then the following film I did was Empire Strikes Back. You know, it was just incredible. The best briefs in my entire life. You know, I sit at a big table. I'm 17. The next age up was like 25. They was like, look like my parents. You know, they were like, big gap. And, uh, and then, you know, Norman Reynolds, the creative director, would give out all the briefs and they go, OK, Steve, this is your brief today. Uh, there's been a Zion cannon attack on the Dagobah system. And I need you to go and make sure that the stormtroopers look like they lost the battle. I didn't even bat an eyelid. I knew exactly what that looked like. I'd go down to soundstage seven and we would really knock the shit out of all these stormtrooper outfits with my airbrush soldering iron melting great big lumps outside their head because they lost the Zion cannon attack. And then I worked on a film called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, it was really lucky because I grew up with animals in Bethnal Green. My father loved animals. We had our own pet chimpanzee in those days. There was no dangerous animal act. We, we were lucky to have this chimpanzee called Primo. Um, he used to sit at a dinner table with us and eat. Uh, my grandmother used to show off if we had guests. She would invite guests at the dinner table. They'd all shit themselves because there's a fully grown fucking chimp at the table thinking, whoa, man, what is this? And uh, she would pass a packet of sweets around and everybody would take a sweet. Primo would wait for his turn so elegantly and charming and he'd put his hand out, the sweets would go in his hand. He'd look into the packet with boss eyes, big fingers like broomsticks, get hold of a sweet, open one, pull one in, get the other, open it, get the sweet all delicate and on cue, throw the sweet away and eat the wrapper that he used to do with everybody going, that's amazing, it's amazing. So we had great time. So I'm saying this because while I'm working on Star Wars with a Dagobah system, George Lucas says, you know what, Steve, we need some snakes here in the, in the forest with, with Yoda. And I went, my dad's got snakes. He said, go to your dad now, ring him, get him some. So my dad rocked up with some reticulated pythons and African pythons and some boa constrictors and we dressed it into the forest. Then when we did Raiders of the Lost Ark, my dad supplied all the animals for the film. He supplied the snakes. It was my pet monkey, the one that ate the, the, the date and the tent. But, um, and, uh, and of course, the stunt woman wouldn't go in the snake pit. She wouldn't go in the snake pit. So they come and got me. I had my legs shaved. I wore the party dress. And next time you see that film, they're my legs with me and Harrison Ford. Later on, when we look at Victor's going to show some images, you'll see me with Harrison Ford and me in the snake pit with, with, that, uh, with that wonderful dress on. So I did that. And then I decided, I said, it, it was Steven Spielberg that did that last one. And I said to George Lucas and Steven, and I said, guys, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm now gonna go, I wanna go and do my own thing. I said, because I've had the most amazing time. 
making things and working on all this amazing film with stories. But I really love the power of the brand. I love the story of brands. And then I was asked, you know, when I was first working in this agency on The Muppet Show, I learned a hell of a lot about brand. And, uh, and I decided to go and set up my own design agency, which I did. So I set up this design agency. Um, you know, you start to get assistance, but immediately I was very lucky. Cartier came to me and I rebranded Cartier. And then I did Christian Dior. And then I did the Ivy Sheikis, Annabelle's, they're all these very, and Skanska came and we did Skanska and, and work with Make and all these wonderful, fabulous brands I was working with. And, and of course, you know, why did I want to do this? Because it was, it was all to do with my dyslexia, about my, how do, you, how do you inspire people? Because everybody's got too much information. If you look at websites, every corporate's website, it's too much information and they talk jargon. And remember Richard Branson and a lot of global dyslexics are out there that you'd like them as your client. Well, actually, as soon as they come onto your website, it's like I say, it's gobbledygook. They can't find what they're looking for and immediately they switch off. And of course it kills them. It's like slitting their wrists. For me, I wanted to create a formula with our brand and what we do is instead of it being informational, it's about being inspirational. I wanted to inspire people. I wanted to spoon feed exactly what they're looking for, not what you think they're looking for. And the key to it is to create wow. And if you can spoon feed information that they create their own wow in their head, then they create wow, not being given stuff that they don't can't read or they're not interested in and they're trying to get through because you're throwing five balls at them. And if you throw five balls, guess what? They drop all of them. The key to it is to throw one and they get it and they love it. And of course, it's not just about that thing about informational and being, for me, to inspire people that <coughs> excuse me, people want to work with you. They want to come and see you, see what you're doing because you've made wow in their head. It's also that it's a science. What we do is a science. There's no risk. People think, oh, you know, because we push the boundaries like we know we do, whether it's architecture, we're always trying to find the new and pushing and pushing and pushing. But what we have to do is definitely push it as much as we possibly can. We have to have both feet on the ground and we push it to the limit. And so for us, you know, it was always about how do we create first and foremost, a memorable brand, because it has to be memorable, it has to be easy to use. Remember, a brand is, it's not about a pretty picture. You know, so many times, oh, you know, sorry guys, there's a lot of architects I know that come to me and they've already done their own brand. They think they can brand, sorry guys, I'm not being rude to any of you. You know, stick to what you do, you're good at building, right? But don't tell me about your brand. It's about, for me, it's horses for courses. So. You know, when it comes to a brand, it's not just a pretty picture. Yeah, it's somebody will design a logo and it'll work on a business card. You try and reduce that for it to go onto a, maybe a cuffling or project it on the side of a wall. All of a sudden, it becomes a muddy mess. And the muddy mess is not good because how do you get that, that continuity and that consistency of people looking at you and knowing who you are? Every time they see you, they know who you are. Why do you think these brands like Apple and Coca-Cola is that it's always beating that same drum. Every time you see that mark, you know who they are because exactly that, it's about putting all those foundations in place to create a brand and a mark that will stand up and hold up to every application that it has to be put through. And of course, it's not just the mark. You know, if we look at that Mercedes badge, one seen, never forgotten. Whenever you see it, you know, you don't even have to read it anymore. And that's the power of the brand. We know why it works. And of course, the key to it is it's always about stories because the subliminal message when a Mercedes badge comes, first of all, you know, it's amazing. You know, it's luxurious. You know, it's German because it's German. It's going to be incredibly engineered and well built and never let you down. So all that subliminal message comes through and it's always so, so important. For me, one of the great stories of all about Mark, the brand, was when Enzo Ferrari in 1923 walked into a very small town and there was Madame Baraka. She was a, one of their relatives and 
she sat down with Enzo and said, Enzo, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to create a car. I'm going to create the best car in the world. I'm going to create a car that everybody will want. And she went, wow, that's incredible. She said, what is this car? He said, it's going to be called a Ferrari. It's Ferrari. I'm going to call it Ferrari. And she went, that's incredible. She said, well, listen, she said, I love you. I've always loved you. And you're a young man. And as you know, your cousin, he was a great war hero here in Italy. He, he had a biplane. And when the biplane, on his biplane, he, he had this lovely logo that he loved, which was a rampant black horse, a horse rearing up. She said, you know what? Unfortunately, as you know, he got killed in battle. But I want to give you that mark as a gift, one, to, one for him to be remembered, but also for you to have it, that it will take away with you and it will bring you strength and it will be successful. And of course, you know, what an amazing story. And of course, that's what he did. He took this incredible rampant horse and Ferrari became Ferrari. So, you know, we always need to have the memorable brand, something that's memorable, people won't forget, once seen, never forgotten. And of course, you know, something that you are proud of. Because when we look at branding companies, regardless of who they are, you know, and we're very fortunate, we branded probably everybody in the world, from the world's biggest robot company to the America's Cup yacht to the oldest brands on the planet. You know, we branded a I branded someone called the Whitechapel Bell Factory, which is 1500. It was there since ben, made Big Ben's Bell, which was incredible. We then did a hat company called Lock Hats, been there since 1676. They made every king and queen's hat still today. And then we have brands like Fortnum and Mason, 1707. So, you know, it's so incredible that we can work with these brands that have been not just gone through recessions, they've gone through world wars. That's how good they are. And that's the power of the brand that, you know, to be proud of who you are. And so when we brand companies and when you brand or if you're rebranding, remember it's not what just goes out is amazing, it's how good you feel because all of a sudden you ain't gonna lose nothing. Every time you go into a meeting or you're gonna present your work, you are going to be fabulous because this is who we are, what we are. And of course, because your communication is so simple that people can find, you know, remember that saying, if it's not on the tin, people don't ask. The most common thing that I get asked is, Steve, I need to generate more business. And I go, trust me, your existing client list is the most valuable thing you already own. Because you did a project, you worked with somebody that created a residential apartment or you built a commercial building and then they move on, don't expect, unless it's on the tin, that you could actually probably design a hospital for them as well. Because these people out there, they only think, oh, you've done my home for me. You can't do my offices or you can't do it because, because it's not on the tin. You haven't told them. So the key to it is always make sure you communicate what you do clearly and simply. And it's that simple, you know, look, if you go into a restaurant and you haven't got, you know, especially if you're in an Italian restaurant and there's not vongole on there, well, you don't ask for it. But trust me, if you said to the chef, excuse me, you can't knock up a vongole, can you? Trust me, they probably will. But it's always about making sure it's on the menu. Clear, simple messaging, spoon feed that information to what you want and, 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 and trust me, you know, the business will come, always come. And as, and as I say, people love to talk about brands. There's a company we just rebranded here called Cast. They were come from an old project management business called EC Harris. EC Harris is a 150 year old brand. It was bought up by Arcadus. Arcadus said, you know what, we're gonna retain your identity we're going to make sure your culture stays the same well we know a few years later they disappear in a sense lost in the ether and therefore they then broke away and came to see me the trouble was with ed harris and the ec harris family and a guy called mark farmer they couldn't uh, use their name anymore well luckily for us we liked when they gave me their analogy about project managers how good they were that they look at the bigger picture first of all from above 
and then they home in on the detail. Well, I like this hawk analogy. It's what a hawk does. A hawk's in the sky. Vision is incredible. Homes down onto that final bit of detail. So we couldn't believe our luck when we found there was one intelligent hawk. The most intelligent hawk on the planet hunts in a group, the only one, and it's called a cast of hawks. First of all, the name cast is a rare name, especially in the construction industry, because it's unlike any other name. But secondly, there's only one hawk that does that, and it's a Harris hawk. So we got the name E.C. Harris back within the group because it's the Harris hawk. And of course, it's a lovely story, and they love telling the story. What's always interesting is that, you know, we always find that when it comes to naming, naming is always contentious. If you, go, if you get your own company or you're setting up a business, you know, it's always difficult naming. But the, but the, 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 the interesting thing about naming is that all names are ridiculous. There's hundreds and hundreds of ridiculous names. Shops with ridiculous names, cars with ridiculous names, businesses with ridiculous names. But all of a sudden, you all of a sudden are looking at are trying to name something and no, I don't like that, and I don't like that, and I don't like that. And it happens so many times. Of course, the most important thing now is to get the URL. You try and get a URL for a name that you really want. It's incredibly difficult. I remember I branded a big uh, internet provider in this country and Europe. And they, the guy rang me one day and he said, Steve, we need to rename the business. We were the commercial, we have a resi side, residential commercial. We've sold the resi side. We're keeping the commercial. We have to rename it. We can't use it. I went back with 17 names, all with URLs, st stood in the boardroom with lots of people and everyone they didn't like, they didn't like, they didn't like, they didn't like. In the end, the CEO said, okay, Steve, can you go away and come back in two weeks with more names? What? I was ushered out, put back in the chauffeur car, being driven back to the station. I said to the chauffeur, take me back. Get on the phone now and tell this guy that I'm coming back. He said he won't like it. I said, I don't care. I'm going to go and tell him. I went back, went back in the boardroom, all Billy Big Bollocks, all trying to lead the meeting. I said, guys, let me tell you, listen to me now. I said, when you go to a hospital, I said, and a friend of yours or your sister has had a baby, that little baby, and you go up and you get that little baby and you go, oh, what's the baby's name? And they go, Algernon. You go, what? Algernon? Algernon, but guess what? That baby after two days becomes Algernon. It can be nothing but. The guy, the CEO, went, okay, Steve, what was the first name? I said, Violtus. He went, great, Violtus. That's the name we're going to have. So remember, never get hung up about naming when it comes to your own company or branding. As long as you can get that URL, and it's a kind of a, got a you can create a story around it, it's a winner. And for us, that's what we do. You know, we're very passionate about with all the brands we work with. And also, I've always gone out to have diversity. We need diversity. I don't, you know, why have I got a great team of people? Why have we got a great client list? It's because we don't just design pill packets all day long. I'd be slitting my fucking wrists every day if I had to keep on another pill packet, another pill packet. For us, one minute, we're designing the best fashion brand in the world. Next minute, we're working on a med tech company that we've learned so much about med tech. We're all kind of checking our temperatures, worried that is there anything wrong with us. Um, and then we're working on the most amazing buildings. We're working with, you know, not just naming companies like this. When it first we were asked, it's PRS, private residential sector. It's now build to rent. So we're naming all these build to rent companies, all these co-working. Then we're looking at, obviously, resi, commercial, and now we're working on the most incredible environmental buildings that are being built here. We're working on one building called Roots in the Sky that has 100 trees on the roof here in Clerkenwell. It's going to have 100 trees. I mean, we've been working with the landscape gardeners, looking at the soils that they're bringing to attract all this fantastic, uh, 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 you know, nature. But also, you know, that diversity of, as I've always said, what's in your guys' industry, this developer, construction, architecture, it's such a world within a world. Everything is in with, sorry, within that, which I love. So it's not just 
about architects. It's not just project managers and all the consultants. It's not just about all the artists and the landscapes. It's about everything that, that I deal with within this industry. Hence why it's one of the most exciting industries to be in because one, everybody, I mean, I'm sure you guys come across the odd idiot, but on the whole, you know, I love going to Mipping because I meet so many people and they're all, and always so charming, always so interesting. And of course, saving the planet on all the things that you guys are working on. So it's an amazing, amazing industry. But like I said, for me, the things that I've learned in life is that the power of the brand is, 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 is the most important thing on the planet. You know, why do you think that all these hundred top brands in the world put all their money back into their brand? It's that keeping something consistent. It's about making it very simple to use. Remember, guys, when you create your own identity or when you have your identity, make sure it's simple. Don't have a corporate guidelines that's five inches thick because no one will ever read it. Do it on a simple page, a one page or two page. Just simple application of how that logo should be used, where it should be used, and keep it simple. Brands have to work in black and white as well as color. Don't ever go to vignette. If you use vignette, sometimes it's difficult because the vignette is difficult to reproduce on all different applications, and you might come unstuck. So if you are going to do it, in a sense, on a shoestring, one color or two color. Two colors is more ownership than one color. We know color theory that if you look at one color, doesn't really give you ownership, but bringing two colors together that are quite uh, with a contrast or interesting, then all of a sudden you have ownership and people recognize that for who you are and what you are. Keep it simple, be proud of who you are and what you are, fly your flag above all your competition and you'll go out and win every time. So I'm not gonna wrap it on anymore. I've been told half an hour is half an hour. I've already gone over half an hour, but remember, your brand is your future. Be happy and proud of who you are. Keep it very, very simple, as I say. Never forget to have a business card because you never know who you're sitting to on the bus or the tube. Don't be a snob because, trust me, I've sat to many CEOs have gone to me. Hey, Steve, where are you going? Or never met me. And Are you going anywhere? No. Like uh, my dearest, dearest friend who, who, told, who says about, you know, here we are a pink cowboy you know if we hadn't have spoken to each other we'd never have met so fly your flag and sit next to people that you don't know because trust me they're probably your next job thank you well thank you so much uh, steve i think right now everyone in the audience wants to keep listening and everyone is <laughs> blown away by the story of, I mean certainly for me the story about Star Wars the whole story of how did you become who you are today is just mind-blowing I mean seriously do you I mean that snake pit you know that Harrison Ford scene I, I know that scene I and mean, I've seen that film everyone's seen that film yes. um, I, I let's let's um uh, I, I know I'm going to be told off, but um, I really, I mean, listening to you is, is just like uh, so interesting. I mean, I have a couple of questions, by the way, just to the audience. We had a format, but we just skipped all the format because we just wanted to listen to Steve. So the, the, the format of today is slightly different to others because it's just it's just really so bloody cool to listen. That is, that's what it is. So just a quick couple of questions, Steve, for the audience today. Um, and just quick ones. The first one is to yourself, what would you tell your younger self today? I mean, you, 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 you've been through like, I mean, everyone's life here looks so dull compared to this. I mean, it's just mental. Uh, so what would you tell yourself, your younger self? Well, first of all, guys, if you ever set up your own business or you're in business, which I'm sure there's a lot of people here working today, is that you know, you have to get a job in the bank. You have to get an actual job. Never rely on people promising you shit because there'll be a lot of people that always will promise you stuff. And time and time again, never rely on it. Don't think, oh, I'm getting that coming in and that's going to happen. And that time and time again, when I first started out, I was promised so much stuff that I thought, oh, this is going to be amazing. Yes, I was promised and some of the things came in, but go out and get it yourself and go to those things that, you know, side spin the obvious. 
don't go to the typical networking event that you think is all going to be right for you because trust me, it doesn't exist. Anywhere there's opportunities, go with opportunities, go with your own heart, go with your own brand, make sure you have your business cards, plenty of them, never run out of business cards, trust me. <laughs> time and time again, that last one that you're going to give out is probably the one that's going to bring in the big one. It's like winning the lottery. So, and of course, always be happy and passionate. Never be, you know, be kind to people. If you're kind to people, people will be kind back to you and people want to be around fun. So definitely make sure that you have integrity, you're honest, you have your business card and actually passionate people want to be around passionate people. Definitely. That's, that's, I'm just, that's, a, that's a logo already for any brand. Um, just uh, going on because otherwise we're going to be told off, Steve. Otherwise we're going to be here until midnight. Um, so, and this is a very particular question about what you do. So, um, how? So, what is the secret? The secret sauce to a successful business model? And by that, I mean, how do you monetize a career on design? Because that is something that hasn't been obvious all throughout. Uh, no. I mean, you have to. What do you do to be successful? Well, I was very lucky, darling. I was very lucky, uh, uh, Paula, uh, uh, because what happened was I got, uh, uh, when I finished out the, the film industry, uh, George Lucas had a party. He had a party for me, and he sat me next to a man called John Paul Getty Jr. I'm not sure whether you know who John Paul Getty is, but John Paul Getty Jr. was probably one of the richest men on the planet. And he sat next to me at this dinner party. He went, and he looked at me and he said, hey, kid, he went, I hear you're doing your own thing. I said, yeah, I am. I am, Mr. Getty. He said, okay, kid. He said, I'm going to give you three, there's three things you need to know. He said, because I hear you're good. And I went, oh, thank you. He said, there's three things, man. He said, first of all, when you set up your own business, make sure you're there before your team comes in. You understand me, man? You're the captain of the ship. You've got to show that you're there. You're flying your flag and you're proud of what your company is and you're in charge, man. You need to be there before anybody else gets in. I went, okay, Mr. Getty. He said, number two, make sure you're there when everybody oh leaves, my okay, man? Look, my so guy. You're one minute after, one minute after they leave, doesn't matter. You've got to be there because you're the man at the helm. You're the one with the shit. They're going to look up at you, okay? You're the, I went, okay, thank you very much. He said, number three, you got to strike oil, kid. you got to strike oil. Now, what was interesting, this was for me a metaphor of you can work your bollocks off. Yeah, you could be there before everyone else. Yeah, you can work all day hard and leave at the end of the day with everybody gone before you. We all know we can work hard, but at the end of the day, you've got to find that thing. His was oil. Mine was difference. I wanted to find true difference with a twist and bring that twist and that formula to the table like I said earlier on, so I can spoon feed information that give them components that everybody then will create their own wow in their head. And that wow was the thing that I created that people come back and back and back because it's the answer to creating something that people use their own imagination. Right, well, Steve, I think people here are gonna tattoo that on their arm tonight, right? <laughs> so I, I, there, some stuff you say here is, it is just really gold dust. So uh, I think I, I mean I think everyone is is just uh, uh, well we'll we'll talk about how to reach out to you later. Uh, but just <laughs> moving on because otherwise we're not going to finish. Um, so and this is a very important one and real real estate storytelling. All right. So can you tell us what buildings and I think we can get some help from Victor here. What buildings have you been working on and. How did you improve the image and perception of the building? I mean, what what are I mean? Can you, Victor? Can you share your the screen for Steve, please? Thank you, Victor. So, so guys, first of all, I'll just show you me as a 21 year old working on Raiders of the Lost Ark. Here I am, Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones with his hat on there. Me <laughs> and my pet monkey. I obviously had a big lot of more hair than now, uh, and that was uh, that was me working on Raiders of the Lost Ark. The next slide, thank you, Victor. There I am wearing the party dress, just about for all the snakes to be put in the well of souls where Harrison would join me and we'll be trying to keep all the snakes at bay. So that was just talking about my last story. If we look on the next slide, Victor, <coughs> here we have an example. 
This was a very interesting development in Hackney. It was run by Hackney Council because the developer was called London Newcastle. London Newcastle are fabulous, but there was a school involved. And this was a primary school. It was a school where it's actually a lot of poor children, poor kids, poverty is in this part of Hackney. But they said that what they would do, they will build these two beautiful towers and build a brand new school below it. So there's an example of how do we merge and tell the story that luxury apartments above a school where schools are noisy, but with these kids, we had to create a formula that people would buy into. So we kept coming back with names and the Hackney Council didn't like any of them because as I said, it's always subjective naming. In the end, I decided we found this name. We love this name. One, it looked like because the building was two towers, so it was symmetrical and it had these two T's and either side, the Otto. But what I did, just to confirm for us to really make it work, because it was on Hackney Downs, this particular school and building, we, we hired a tree mapper. This man went out in Hackney Downs for me in this big part of London, in this park, and came back to me with everything I wanted. He didn't just come back to say it was oak trees and beech trees and birch trees and London plane trees. He came back to say there's eucalyptus trees, cherry trees, uh, pomegranate trees. And therefore the word Otto means the coming together and make it a beautiful essential oil, bringing all these amazing flavors to make essential oil. So we went into Hackney Council. I said, this building is gonna be called the Otto. And the reason is, it's for this reason of the man that went out in the park to find all these exotic trees. And it means the coming together of essential oils. They gave me a standing evasion in this Hackney Council, and we created this beautiful formula that wasn't just for the, just for a beautiful, uh, a, a, a light for light talking about these exotic plants and greenery and flowers, but also the children loved it. And we rebranded the children's uniform and they wear all this beautiful color and the kids are so happy. The residents are so happy that they're looking after this school and part of their money, because we said, don't fucking hide it, that you guys have invested all this money that, well, I want you to put one entrance for the school and the other side of the entrance where you come in. Be proud of it, that these people living in these apartments have actually made this school happen. And actually it's been the most amazing success story. Thank you. The next one is this. Uh, we was asked to, this is a commercial building, uh, Paul Monaghan, of, I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic, but it's MHMN or something like that. Uh, he won the Sterling Prize for a particular project he did at school. Uh, Paul Monaghan, you can Google him. He asked me, would we work on this building, commercial building? Now, as you can see on the right-hand side, it's got all these step terraces. Because it was surrounded by warehouses, there was lots of rights of light problems. We worked with a company and helped with them. Their identity was called Gordon Ingram Associates, GIA, and they had to do a rights of light issue. So because it was a rights of light issue, once we looked at all these models of the shadows of the windows, we called it the ray. And what happened was on the left-hand side, if you look at that hoarding, um, we were very, I was very cheeky because this was the actual reflection and the light coming in at certain times. But at night I went out and I, masked up with masking tape the pavement and then I jet washed the area clean which you're not allowed to because the council said it's illegal uh, but we, I did it anyway and what happened was there was a guy walking down the road and as he walks down the road he's not looking up and he suddenly sees this shadow which is impossible because he's got a hoarding next to him so how can any light come from that he looks up he sees the ray he rings them he was the head of LinkedIn now the LinkedIn headquarters are in that building, the Ray, because of that little bit of jet washing that I did on the floor, the Ray. The next one is incredible. The first bill to rent company, PRS, came here over 10 years ago. They were called Essential Land. I love the word essential. We then came up with Essential Living. Uh, I like the icon, which is an open room plate, but it's also an abstract E. Uh, Hoardings are very important. We created this hoarding 
We create hoardings for every every uh, uh, development. This was called Three Colts Lane. It was where they used to do all the blacksmiths in Bethnal Green. This particular street, the street we um, sorry the building we obviously called Three Colts, and we created this horse head. Um, from these hoardings, people would then obviously Google and. Within two weeks of these hoardings going up, we felt we filled 420 apartments within this essential living building. On the left-hand bottom corner, I created this. They wanted art, but I said we'd create our own piece of art. Because I branded several mannequin companies, I had connections. We created this 15-foot coming together of two androgynous people. One is called, uh, one, uh, this was called the Spirit of Living. And the spirit of living was the coming together of people, about neighborhood, about sharing, someone sitting on someone's shoulders so you must trust them, and someone who's on someone's shoulders must be having a good time, and also having a great vision to look around and see everything that you want. So it's exciting. And the spirit of living is created, it's branded obviously in the yellow and black, and it's in every one of their developments. Also, we created a key fob, a miniature key fob, which everybody gets, which is magnetic for them to get in. And everybody tells their story about the spirit of living. And I think that's it. Ah, last but not least, make Ken, Ken Shuttleworth uh, uh, asked me to help them with their brand. And he loved what we did. And of course, someone who has so many amazing buildings, what do you do? You keep showing another amazing building and another amazing building. All of a sudden it becomes, you just forget them and you're not interested. So we wanted to create a formula that was for his website that was all about make, but all about textures coming together again and, and creating something that was very easy on the eye, very quick, but also Red is, is the make brand. And last but not least, uh, last but not least, oh, we haven't got there yet, right? That's, gosh, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm running through quickly. Well, I think all, all the examples you're showing are like, meant to, it's, it's just worth going through all of them again. But I mean, I just <laughs> keep a couple of, I just keep a couple of ideas, like, you know, the, 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 the way you find a sense within, you know, these, these school and these residents having paid for the school and make them proud of it. It just, it's, it's almost as if you put a seed on people's heads rather than the name. It's like you, the storytelling is so powerful that it just grows, that seed grows into a plant. It, and, that's, and that's what you do for every, every branding exercise. Paula, it is, darling. You know, we remember good stories, not bad stories. And if you can yeah. create good stories every time, People are proud to tell someone and they want to tell the story. They're not lazy because they can tell the reason why. And it always is. And of course, when London, Newcastle were worried about, oh, this is a school. It was supposedly a rough school for kids, you know, far from that. You know, once you tell the truth and explain it, the reasons why people want to buy into it. And of course, it was amazing because we had a workshop with these children. They all came and, uh, and I said to one of my designers, and literally, they took me for literal. They take me literal anyway, because they never know what I'm going to be saying. But uh, one thing was, I said to them, this particular junior designer, I meant it as to buy a lot of them. I said, go and buy me a hundred quid's worth. Of, I said, listen, I want, I, I said, I want you to get me a lot of Haribo sweets. There's three children coming because they were obviously clever how they chose three children from the school. One was a girl, one was black, one was white, one was Indian, you know, so they had a complete mix, amazing, all these kids. So what was fascinating was I said to this assistant, a junior designer, I said, I said, I want lots of sweets. Go and get me like 100 quids worth of Haribo. She spent and bought 100 quids worth of Haribo. You can't believe what 100 pounds worth of Haribo looks like. So what we did, we got a real big bowl. I got a huge bowl and we filled the whole bowl up and put it on the table. Now, remember, these children, they come from literally the bread line and they came into my studio, beautiful children with the headmistress. I'd already said to the headmistress, she says, Steve, you can say what you like and also uh, uh, you can give them the sweets. And so I said to them when they came in, I said, guys, we're doing a workshop. 
remember you have to enjoy this. I said, you're going to have fun and we're going to enjoy it. But you see these sweets. I said, if they're not eaten by the time you leave, you're in big trouble. Do you understand? Well, you've never seen kids. Every moment they had a lollipop, they're eating the thing. Apparently, they was up like for 17 nights, never slept again, but they had a great time. And they took <laughs> them back to the school. And the school <laughs> had the most amazing day and week. And of course, they're very proud of, again, of their badge and their color and their story that they have. So people in the audience, if you go visit Stephen Shortage, you'll get some Haribo. So just rush <laughs> off to his office. Hey, you Steve, will. Just, Trust me. Steve, I'm going to move on because we're like just very late and everyone is like, hey, hey, go, go, go. So I'm like, yeah, no, no. But this is like just guys, guys, everyone's here listening. So let's let me just ask you something which is relevant to to the audience and to what you're explaining here, which is the era of digital information. So wh what is it about this? I mean, what, I mean, the, so this is how, how do you deal with, with these, you know, digital information and green digital design and yeah. how do you deal with this today? I mean, it's, is the new, is the new language, right? It, it is darling. And also remember the new language now is about speed. Unlike me, sorry, waffling on, but speed is look, Speed is now you want to have green digital. And remember, green digital now is about the smaller carbon footprint that you can have. And that means that if you can create a website that downloads that quick, which we are creating now, we've just got an accolade with Google where if you Google anybody's website, it will be between 40 and 60% download. We are doing 100% now. I have a design team, my own web development team in the Midlands, in Wolverhampton, that we have that are superstars 100% download, quick like that. But also, as I said, spoon feeding the right information and they can come on, find what they're looking for and click off immediately. And therefore they're not trying to find what they're looking for, hours and hours on websites, carbon footprint, which is bonkers. So that's a green website. We all need to make sure that all our information now is that quick, see what you want, they get what they want and then they're off. Amazing. So the, the, the secret is speed, isn't it? So yeah. what, one last thing, um, Steve, before we move on to the audience we, who may want to ask a couple of things. So this is just, I mean, the closing question. What is rewarding about what you do? And I think everything is. But, but when you say dress for the party and the party will come to you, is that a life motto? What, what do you tell the audience about not being forgotten in business? Thank you, darling. Absolutely. The first part of that question is, you know what? Like I said, we've worked with brands that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. We work with brands that are new startups that have never nobody's heard of. And for me, what makes me so proud is that they come to us and they trust me. They give me their trust to be able to create an identity, a formula, a story that will make them more successful than anything they've ever dreamt of. And that's what we do. We, it's not about, you know, uh, 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 like I said earlier on, a pretty picture. It's about a science. Yes, we, we know that there's the science of everything and there is creativity to that. But for us, it's to bring that twist, that difference and the truth of difference that actually is a story that people get it and understand it. And for me, if I can make brands more successful, which we do day in, day out, It makes me incredibly proud. It makes me incredibly happy. And of course, I have lots of amazing friendships with all our brands that we work with because first of all, they're our client and then they become our friends. But knowing full well that it's about making it successful. The second thing is absolutely it's about being memorable. And, you know, my philosophy in life, as I said earlier on, coming from a poor family, luckily for me, you always have a rich aunt. And I had a realization at nine years old, my mum's Jewish, all her fat sisters, obviously. And I went to my rich aunt's house one day at nine years old and she had cabinets full of china and glass and the most amazing objects. And I said to her, when do you use all this? She said on special occasions and a week later she died. She never used any of it. I said to my mum at nine, I have elder brothers. I said, mum, guess what? I said, as from this day, I'm going to dress for a party every day. I'm going to wear my party outfit every day. I'm not going to wait for a special occasion because we're a long time dead. So everybody who's listening now, please get your little silver backless number on tomorrow. 
Victor, get that white tuxedo on, man. I want to see it. I want to see you wearing that. And trust me, the party will come to you. You'll be walking down the street. You'll get on a bus. You'll get on a tube. People are coming and say, man, what are you doing? What do you do? How do you? And trust me, it will be amazing. The party will come. Never wait for a special occasion. Tomorrow, get on it. And trust me, you'll have an amazing time and amazing life. And above all else, make people happy. We need to make people happy. Make people laugh. Have more friends. But dress for that party. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Steve, everyone in the audience today is going to have dinner on the good China dishes, right? So everyone will have your expensive China dishes, all right? <laughs> please, please, never keep nothing for best anymore. If you break it or lose it, don't worry. You would have, you would have had a fabulous time eating on that Louis XIII plate. Trust me, beans on toast taste delicious on that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I have to count all my Louis XIII dishes, but I think I have some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my Louis XIII IKEA dishes, right? So, uh, Steve, I mean, this was this was really, really, I think one of the best chats we've ever had. You, I mean, I, I'd like just to let the audience ask a couple of questions. Uh, Victor, please go ahead and, and let's let the audience, if there's any question from people here, um, who they want to ask. Yeah. Um... Uh, thank you, Steve. We we have some. If anybody also wants to uh, unmute uh, uh, themselves, uh, please raise your hand, and 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 you, uh, we can do that as well. Uh, the first one on the chat, I think, because they're liking all of the storytelling, Steve, is about your uh, Ganeshi symbol beside yeah. you. Uh, they're saying, what message does it convey, and is it part of the of this meeting's brand? Well, thank you, guys. Uh, first of all, my wife is half Indian, half French. We have a big family in India. I've traveled everywhere in India, from Bhubaneswar uh, uh, to Rajasthan, to Jaipur, to uh, uh, Mumbai, and caught one of the biggest fish that I've ever wanted to catch in India. So first and foremost, I love India. First and foremost, I love all the stories of all the gods. And I found this paper mache Ganesh uh, uh, in, in Mumbai. And it was in the days that you could bring it back on your lap without having problems. So it's a paper mache Ganesh. He, it makes me very happy being in my studio. As you know, I love color and I love the story behind Ganesh because it's all about prosperity and uh, 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 bringing good. So that's the reason why I have Ganesh. And sorry, I love objects. I have lots of objects. I have relationships with objects. All my objects make me happy and they inspire me. It's a long story, but next time anybody's in Shoreditch and you want to learn about my obsession with objects, I'll be dressed for a party waiting for you and we can have tea, wine, gin, whatever you want. But please come into Shoreditch. You're all welcome anytime. So guys, everyone in the audience, Steve has allowed us to share his contact details and his <laughs> office in Shoreditch is, is really amazing. And he does actually host people and receive people and you can just be inspired i have some of his books which i worship because they are just i mean just for life in general the, the branding and the graphic design is so strong so every so just if you're just in london just just go to shoreditch anytime you're always welcome yeah. truly please yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry victor go ahead next question yeah we I, I don't know if we have time for more but um uh, maria's asking if there was one brand uh, that you would want to work with uh, which one would it be? You know, that's very interesting, mate. Uh, um, uh, uh, it, it, it's 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 probably the wild, the the, the World Wildlife Foundation. Um, uh, 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 I love animals and 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 saving the planet. And I think that would be a brand that I would really like to get my teeth into. Not literally, of course, but um, uh, 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 <laughs> I, I would I would definitely love to work with that brand. We, so we help them for a bit, but but that's a brand. I'm not. We're very fortunate. If you look at our client list, we probably work with with lots of wonderful brands. And I'm not saying I never wanted to work with them, but but that one that one question is definitely something now that I'd like to work on a brand with animals. And also, obviously, you know, futures. I love futures. I love sustainability. I love looking at new. You know, we're working at the moment with modular. We're working at wellness, you know, we have to be careful. A thing that I didn't talk about when it comes to property, guys, any of you doing buildings and all that, 
please get rid of luxury or fucking unique. I can't bear it. It's like, oh my God, are you fucking serious? Another luxury pile of shit, another fucking, you know, a, a, a unique apartment. Fuck off. Right. So Every, everyone, Steve, everyone has to write down not unique, not luxury. Right? Exactly. 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 So, 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 so we're always trying to work with the new and find, like I said, so for us, it's great to work with, you know, all the things that we now need to be working on. And so they're the brands that I like to work with, Victor, you know, apart from the animal brands, it's about futures, finding things that don't exist and creating brands that's never existed before for that subject. Okay. Um, Ani is asking if, if you could give your opinion in general about uh, strategic design uh, or, or maybe interior design or what do you think about that whole um, industry or, or side of, of design? Yeah, I, you know, there's a, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a fine line, right? So I like the idea of, of, of we love interior design. But the problem sometimes with interior design is two interior design. Um, I like the idea of the branded environment. If we brand a corporation or we brand a building for a corporation, I can't bear when an interior designer gets my logo and makes a fucking carpet pattern out of my logo. Why do I want people walking on a fucking brand? Don't you understand that subconscious thing that you're being trodden on with feet on your brand for me or sticking it on a cushion or having some simple, that's not in fucking interior design. So I'm sorry. So for me, branded environment is about smell, texture, and actually doing something very different. But there's lots of amazing interior designers and obviously having that environment that we know when we go, wow. So yeah, I mean, there's a fine line. People that do it well, do it very well. People that don't do it bad, sorry, don't do it well, do it very fucking bad. Okay, and uh, I really like this last question, so maybe we can end on it. Um, what advice would you give to young designers that just finished their degree and don't have context, but they want to start their own business in interior design? Well, well done, guys. Uh, well done. Well, first of all, never give up. First and foremost, what I had to do myself is there's a word called grafting. You, you know the word graft? You have to work hard. It's a cockney word in London, grafting. My dad always used to say I was a grafter. I could work nonstop, never stop working, believe in yourself, find your own truth of who you are and what you are, your own way of doing things. And as I said, what goes around comes around. Always be charming, be proud of who you are, fight your corner. Because trust me, when I used to go into a boardroom, and there'd be all the table full of all the most important people asking me to create their brand. We've got no idea. That's why they've asked me to come in. And also, I then, you know, they blank sheet of paper. They have not got a clue. Put something on it. Guess what? They all become fucking experts. What? What? What do you know about? Oh, I wouldn't do green if I was you. I wouldn't have that. What do you know about fucking branding, right? So you have to fight your corner. So all you young designers. Don't listen to all that shit. Do what you do. Be proud of what you do. Find the thing that you really love to do. Because remember, if you find that thing you love to do, you'll be good at it because you haven't got to worry about, oh, is this right or is this wrong? You'll fucking know because you're good at it. Do what you do best. Be proud of who you are. Fight your corner and tell them to fuck off. And actually, you'll win. That's the answer to setting up your own business. Well, is that clear, guys? <laughs> I don't think that was clear. Um, um, Victor, please go, go ahead. I, I, yeah, sorry. I'm no, I, I, I just know. wanted to uh, thank both you, Paula, and, and Steve for this uh, amazing and, and super inspiring, uh, I don't know what to call this, uh, event, masterclass, <laughs> interview or, or what it was or storytelling in general but uh, but it was amazing um somebody asked in the chat before if this was going to be available uh, we have recorded it and we will be sending it through event bright tomorrow so if anybody missed it they can they can see it then and uh to all of you that are here thank you so much for for joining us today 
if you have any questions about uh, any masters here at IE, I'm going to put my email on the chat, but I'll let Steve and, and Paula uh, also have the final remarks. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for your out of the box thinking, for your fresh approach. And I think everyone tonight is going to speak about you at dinner table. Honestly, <laughs> I am. I think it's it's just a. Uh, it's just interesting. It's just inspiring. If you cannot see all the all the texts on the side, but everyone, and I'm talking from Syria to Milan, Colombia, Delhi, Lisbon, Iran, everyone finds your your stuff inspiring. So there is something here, guys. That there, there's a message here worth uh, worth sharing and worth telling others. So thank you so much, Steve. Well, thank you all very much for, as always, you know, you know, asking me to do this. I always love to do this because you know what, like I said, what goes around comes around. We must share our knowledge, you know, and we must. And, and of course, one day, hopefully, it will be great to see you all in person. And I truly mean that. And if I ever go to any countries, if you give me your details, then actually I might knock on your door dressed as a party too. But you're all welcome to come to Shoreditch and have tea and, uh, and, and good luck. Remember what I said, remember, you know, the world's an amazing time. There's great opportunities, even though we live in lots of doom and gloom because of social media and the world's got smaller. We're going to wake up with that every day. But you know what? You're all passionate people. You all love what you do and actually go out and enjoy it and make other people happy around you and, and, uh, and, 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 and lots of love and love and kisses to you all. <laughs>